Greetings to you all. It's time for the Ask Me Anything 2018 results. A little bit ago, I made a video asking for you to give me topics or questions, and then we had people vote on them based upon how many thumbs up likes they got. As promised, I woke up on Sunday, September 30th to check and see what the results were and took screenshots of whatever the voting was at that time. The top three voted for questions will be answered in this video, along with a few others that are some quick ones of my choosing. Meanwhile, the top three topics that were voted for, well, those are going to have a video explore those topics next season. The top three topics that you guys voted for are as follows. From Mary Beth McDonald, end of summer failing milkweed. By the end of the summer, your milkweed leaves might be turning yellow. By this time, insects have found them. Is there anything that we can do to help out the milkweed, to treat it, to prevent some of these things from happening? What are some options? I shall look into it. From WM Crash, Caterpillar Population Density. What are the concerns with crowding and overcrowding? What risks are there? What are the ways of spotting those risks early? Just how many caterpillars is too many for the volume of your container? Yeah, I think that's a pretty good topic. Surprised I haven't done it yet. We'll see that one next season. Now the third topic voted in was from J1, and he requested a video showing how to hand pair monarch butterflies. I'm sorry J, you're awesome, but I'm not going to do that topic. Some might notice that I've never really talked much at all about monarch breeding. I only really brought it up in the most recent video. Quite possibly without knowing it Jay, you may have stumbled into a topic that's actually kind of sensitive and controversial in the monarch butterfly enthusiast and scientific world. There's a difference between finding wild eggs and even wild caterpillars and bringing them in, rearing them to adults, and then releasing them, compared to actually deciding which boys and girls should get together and breeding monarchs. And it's when people get into breeding that it is a lot more possible for people to do some things wrong that could actually impact the monarch butterfly population in a negative way, especially in the genetics way. Officially, I neither encourage nor discourage the breeding of monarchs for there are ways to responsibly do it. What I do think maybe is best and still respectful to Jay and those who voted for his topic would be to actually make a video that really fleshes out what the concerns are and the risks with breeding. Go a little bit more in depth with it. So that's what I'm gonna do for you. I hope that uh, is satisfactory. Now I don't know if you viewers then are gonna count that as officially doing a topic and that's why I've chosen also the next fourth most voted one and I'm gonna do that one too. From Emily Herson, what happens to our butterflies after we release them? Specifically the idea of what would happen to like a third generation versus a fourth generation. Do they start migrating right away? Do they hang around our yards? Well, this is actually something I've wanted to explore for a bit of time now and I'm gonna finally make one next season. A video discussing really how the idea of fourth generation monarchs migrating, well, it's kind of a general rule. And with all general rules, there are exceptions. And actually this is a place where there's plenty of exceptions. To say that it's the fourth generation monarchs that are migrating, and hey, I've, I've said it many times in these videos, well, it's a bit of a simplification. Let's actually see in that video next season as to what the real details are. I think it's gonna be a really interesting video. Okay, on to the questions. Before we get into the top three, let's do some quick rapid fire ones. These are ones I chose because actually the answer to them is pretty quick. From JMW, NYC, PRR. Have any of your monarchs that you've tagged been found or recovered? No. From Andre Rodriguez, do you raise any other types of butterflies? No. I did do a little stint once with some eastern black swallowtails. Didn't go well. None of them survived. I accidentally fed them some organic parsley, which had BT bacteria as a pesticide. Did you know that as long as they use BT bacteria, they can still label things organic because that bacteria is organic? Yeah, killed them all, wasn't fun. From Richard Cranium, how do you get all the milkweed that you need to feed the caterpillars? Well, I don't know if this question is about me specifically or if you're just saying, how does one get enough milkweed? If it's about me specifically, check out some of the other videos. I have a trail that I go for runs on in the morning in the summer and there is plentiful amounts of milkweed there. That's why I'm able to take in as many as I do. But if you're asking just in general, what I would definitely recommend, and you're helping out the monarch butterflies better than even raising them, is to plant milkweed. Find wherever you can. 
This is the number one way to help out the monarch butterfly is restoring its habitat. So whether it be in your yard or it's places in nature that you find a good spot where it won't be mowed down or even getting in touch with certain municipalities such as getting them planted in parks, libraries, courthouses, schools. Plant the milkweed. Look long term. If you only have enough milkweed to maybe take in four or five caterpillars and you want to take in more, well, get those seeds planted. If you've got more plants, then you can start taking in more monarch butterflies. And you also then know you are helping to restore that habitat, which really is the way to help them. Alex Strauss asks, if you weren't a teacher, what other profession do you see yourself doing? Well, I know because of my love of chemistry, I'd be doing something in that field. And back in college, I tossed around the idea of being an environmental chemist. After environmental chemist, though, I think maybe second place might have been a material scientist. A type of chemical engineer that really designs and develops brand new types of materials that nobody ever has before. We're talking about things like alloys, ceramics, polymers. It's an amazing cutting-edge field of chemistry. Now for the other questions that didn't get the top votes, but were really good ones and maybe didn't have necessarily the shortest answer, believe me, I hear you and it's definitely shaping what I'm deciding to cover next season. So I thank you all for contributing what you did. And now for the most voted for top three questions. From Aiden Mayshack, if I release my butterflies at my house, would they be able to find the nature center that's about a half mile away, uh, find the milkweed that's there? Do they have, in other words, navigation skills? Would they be able to? Yes. And in fact, quite easily. When we talk about the range that a typical individual monarch has in a given day, it definitely depends upon whether it's migrating or not. But still, migratory monarchs have been known to travel anywhere from 50 to 100 miles a day along that migratory path. Now, I wasn't able to find any information on what a, just an individual monarch's typical daily range would be beyond just sources that were saying a wide range or up to several miles. But either way then, within a half mile, yep, that's definitely an easy possibility. But also I think part of the question here is, would it just stumble upon that milkweed or would it be able to detect it? Would it be able to sense where that milkweed's at? Well, when it comes to both moths and butterflies, their antenna are incredibly sensitive instruments. Those antenna are very much like our sense of smell. They have olfactory detectors in them. They're able to sense odors. But their antenna are far more accurate and sensitive than our noses. Just a few molecules of an odor or a pheromone can be detected. But even so, those odorous molecules, they have to still come into contact with the antenna. So really, it's not so much a question of would the monarch be able to detect it? It could. The question is, is the wind blowing the right way? Those molecules still have to come into physical contact with the antenna, so the wind needs to be able to take them there. Could the wind blow the scents of the milkweed plant a half mile to the monarch? Yes. And even in that very low concentration of odor, while we wouldn't be able to smell it, the monarch butterflies could. Something else really awesome about this is that with the two antenna, well, they're able to detect which direction it's coming in stronger. Just like we have two ears, so that way we can hear in stereo and we can easily pick out which direction a sound is coming from, depending upon which of the two antenna gets a little bit more molecules of a certain odor, they are able to then detect that must be the direction that that odor is coming from. Now with all that said, keep in mind though, when you release a monarch butterfly, finding milkweed is not necessarily on the top of its priority list. So the scent of nectar producing flowers, which granted could be milkweed flowers, and the scent of mates, and in half the cases the scent of rival males, that's going to influence where the monarch decides to head to first. Next up from Susan Smith, how many monarchs do you leave in an enclosure? Well, there isn't a set number of how many caterpillars can you put together per cubic inch or per liter of a container. And some of you might realize this question is kind of overlapping one of the topics that we're going to discuss next year. But still, what I'll bring up now is, you know, when it comes to these containers, one per container would of course be perfect, would be ideal. But it's not really that feasible for us to do if we're raising plenty of monarchs. But what about two in a container? Is that really much of a risk? Three? Four? Eleven teen? When is it too much? And certainly the volume of these containers definitely plays a role in this. Well, there isn't a firm line to draw between this number's okay and this next number's not. It's really about probability. It's like asking, how many spins of the roulette wheel before my one number comes up? 
Statistically, 1 in 36, not counting those zeros. But that doesn't mean after 36 spins that your number will have only come up once. Could have come up three or four times. Could have come up no times at all. It's all about probability. And the same thing is true with keeping monarch caterpillars together. The more we have in a container, the more the risk for disease, infections, spreading of parasites, outbreaks, increases. You could have a small container with 15 caterpillars in there, all jam-packed and overcrowded. Not recommended. And all 15 could turn out healthy. Meanwhile, you could have a container that just has three or four in it, and because one had an infection, the rest get that infection as well. For me, as stated in some of my other videos, I start off with small to-go food containers. And in those, I try to keep it to six. I am willing, if I'm going through a lot of numbers, to push that up to seven or eight. But I really don't feel comfortable going past eight. In my larger containers, seen in plenty of the videos too, I'll go with eight to ten in there, though sometimes I might go to eleven or twelve. But that's usually only if some are already up at the ceiling getting ready to J-hang. Then that's not really contributing to the crowding issue. And these are the numbers that I've been comfortable with because I haven't seen any ill effects because of it. Maybe based upon the volume of my containers I could go more, but I don't really want to push it and find out if that's a good thing or a bad thing. The only way to start finding out what the bad numbers are is to push the numbers up and see a bad result happen. So the best I can really say is there's what I'm doing and you can take that as your own inspiration as to judging based upon the size of your containers what you feel comfortable with. But what I should also point out is that one of the reasons why I feel comfortable with those numbers is because I'm also doing what I can to prevent infections in the first place. Through bleach treating eggs, leaves, and through proper sanitation of those containers once a week, I've been able to reduce the risk of what kind of outbreaks and diseases could be occurring. For such sanitation procedures, there already are some videos that I've made that exist, and I've put their links down in the description below. Alright, and the most voted for question came from Stormy Rider 37 Have you ever calculated the male versus female hatching success rate, and does it somehow depend upon the weather? Well, first off, I'm guessing you're talking about adult monarchs that are emerging from their chrysalis. And we might see now why also that word eclosing exists. That's the term for when an insect comes out of its pupa stage. Technically, hatching means to come out of the egg, and so that's why having another term is necessary for really being able to describe which it's doing. But I think I got gotcha. you. As far as adults emerging, well, the best I can do for you is let's look at the data. To keep things kind of simple though, looking at the data from the last three years, for 2016 I wasn't really taking the data on how many males and females I was having emerge until I started testing for OE parasites. Once I started doing that, I was also on those note cards writing down whether they were male or female. And that year then, I tested my first 19 monarch butterflies. Of those 19, 15 were male and 4 were female. That seems quite skewed, doesn't it? That makes 78.9% of them male and 21.1% of them female. But understand, that's a really small sample size. Again, if we go back to that roulette analogy, not counting those green zeros, Half the time, your numbers are going to be black. Half the time, the numbers are going to be red. But that doesn't mean you can't have a string of numbers where several black numbers in a row come up. In 2017, out of 74 monarchs that I raised and was testing for OE, 42 of them were male and 32 of them were female. And this year, 2018, I've released 182 monarch butterflies. And of that 182, 93 were males and 89 were females. That's a lot closer to a 50-50 ratio. And in fact, it's only a difference really of two butterflies. If two of the males weren't male and instead were female, well then it would be a perfect 50-50 ratio. You might in fact notice that looking at all three years, the larger the sample size I really had, the closer to a 50-50 ratio it was, which is to be expected. And certainly looking at the entire sample of those three years of data put together, we're looking at about 55% male to 45% female. But in truth, even with just 275 monarchs altogether, probably that's still too small of a real sample size to really extrapolate that for the entire population. I'd be interested now to see, after a couple more years of data, how close that ratio is to 50-50. As for whether or not weather, no pun intended, can affect this or not, I'm guessing we're mostly talking about temperature, right? 
Well, sorry, but I wasn't actually recording any of the temperatures while I was seeing which ones were closing and, you know, tracking what the temperatures were during their entire time of development. However, here's what I can tell you. Entomologists have already pretty succinctly determined that for monarch butterflies, sex is determined at fertilization. So whether or not it's going to be male or female occurs once the mating has happened before the eggs are even laid. But unlike us mammals, where we have XX for female and XY for male, where the males are heterozygous, for butterflies, they instead have a ZZ for male and ZW for females, where females are heterozygous. It's the females that actually determine the sex. So to try to give the question a good answer, I looked up some information on this as far as does temperature at all affect the sex ratio of monarch butterflies, and the answer was actually pretty cool. Temperatures can affect the sex ratio for monarch butterflies. At very cold and very hot temperatures, that actually can cause an uneven division of the game tees in monarch butterflies. Colder temperatures can cause a slight bias towards female game tees when it comes to the female sex chromosomes that are donated to the egg. Meanwhile, at warmer temperatures, this can cause a slight male bias in the division of the game tees. From what I've read, though, this is a pretty slight bias towards females when it's colder and males when it's warmer, and even then, these are some extremer temperatures that they're not going to easily see in nature. And it also had to be temperatures that were for a prolonged amount of time. All right, great topics, great questions, and thank you so much for contributing to it. It really gives me a good feel for what kind of information you guys would like to see out there next year. Till next time, I'm Rich Lund, and remember, raising the monarchs helps, but planting milkweed will actually solve the problem. Catch you later.